Hi everybody. Hello. This is Ginger Rankin with Izzy Harriet and Company. And um, I just returned from a doctor's appointment this morning and I thought, well, I'll just hop on here uh, really quick and share a few things that are in my heart with you. And you can just join in whenever you uh, get here. I'll wait just a second to see if we have any any people that will get on here with us. Uh, it's a good day today. Finally, the, the heat is changing uh, here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we are experiencing something other than 105 degree temps out every day. So everybody's pretty happy about that here. And uh, I guess I am too, although I spend most of my time indoors. <clears throat> so it doesn't really <clears throat> affect me one way or the other. But I know all the people that I'm around, they're happy. <laughs> and when they're happy, it makes me happy. Amen. Hey, I was just, while I was at the doctor's office, I had my phone with me and I was just, uh, looking a little bit at Facebook and, uh, excuse me, cough drop here. I noticed a, uh, an article or writing a post by Focus on the Family. And, uh, they were speaking to mothers raising their daughters in this day that we're living in right now. And I had just been talking with my own daughter uh, yesterday about this very thing and how the culture that we live in today, our society. Hi, Susan. Oh my goodness, it's so good to see you, dear. It's been a long, long time. Um, but we were talking about this uh, ourselves, just the two of us, about how uh, culture today is really having and purposely having a great effect upon our children. Y'all know this. You don't need me to tell you about it. You know it for yourselves. Um, but what are we, what are we as Christians who are responsible in this day, every day, for how we live our lives, how we influence other people, if we make a difference or not. And Jesus wants us to make a difference. We are the difference, amen? We are the light in a dark world. And you know, I love this illustration that the Lord gave me many years ago and he said, Ginger, you know, if you bring a candle into a room and it's light in the room. The candle is the flame from the candle isn't isn't going to show up that much. It's not going to be a noticeable difference. Amen. The darker the room gets, the more that flame <clears throat> is going to shine. Amen. The more you're going to be aware that there is a light in the room. And that is us today, in this day and hour, friends. That's you and me. And what are we going to do today to be that flame in the darkness? Well, as I was reading this article, it was like they had just quoted what I was saying to my daughter yesterday about, you know, culture and she said, you know, Mom, uh, it's up to the parents. And I said, yes, Holly, it is up to the parents. But when you consider if a child is attending a public school, how many hours a day are they there comparative to how many hours a day they're at home with you as the parent? How many hours a week are they at school with their friends, their peers, their teachers, 
people who have great, great influence and much, much pressure to place upon our children today. I think, I know you're all aware of it. I know you are. And I recall my daughter a couple of years ago was asked to do a um, Skype teaching with a class full of, oh, I would say middle school age children and she was asked to speak to them about uh, sex trafficking online and how dangerous it can be for, for kids even their their age. And you know that's a that's a touchy, touchy subject to approach with children who are not your own and children who you know, it's, it's just a touchy subject. And Holly uh, was invited to share what she knew because she was helping in the, in the industry, she was helping to bring girls out of sex trafficking. So she knew about that. And so she was sharing that. And I was reading an article um, just the other day, uh, my, uh, ministry friend Eunice Bennett Ministries um, she posted an article about France and um, and how uh, let me see this here one minute okay um, how in France they're they're trying to change laws right now about incest and whether incest, once the child is an adult, if incest within the family, of course that's what it is, um, would be legalized. So you wouldn't be charged for incest when you're an adult. Wow, you know, some really bad, crazy, things happening in our day and hour. And I want to talk to you just a second about something the Lord showed me back in uh, 2009, I believe it was, when I went to Iowa for the same-sex marriage uh, law when it was passed. And um, the Lord showed me before I even went up there, and I didn't go up to me, I didn't know why I was going up. I just, the Lord said, go, and I went. And things, once I went, then things started to come into place. And I remember before I went, though, um, the Lord showed me my ministry vehicle, and the whole side of it had been uh, beaten in, like, with a ball bat. And... I knew in my spirit instantly that if I was going to take a stand for uh, righteousness in this day, that I had better be prepared for the attack. That's what the the um, the beating on my vehicle represented. You're going to come under attack. You're going to come under persecution if you are going to stand for righteousness in this day, in this country. And I believe that this is global. It, it is not just in this country, okay? And as I was, uh, I posted this something about this the other day, just a little bit. But I was reading in the foreword of my Bible I have been for the past couple of days, and uh, I was reading where Nehemiah, and I love this, I love Nehemiah and Ezra, when they went back to rebuild the temple and the wall, and Nehemiah, of course, was the one who was, uh, led the rebuilding of the wall. And I want to read this to you in the for from the forward of my Bible, and it says that Nehemiah went to Jerusalem about four 
45 BC as a civil engineer to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and restore it to a fortified city. He arrived in Jerusalem under the authority of the king of Persia. Ezra, the grandson of Helkiah the priest, came to Jerusalem in 457 BC, and he was a priest teaching religion to the people. Y'all know that the Old Testament priesthood, I never knew this until I wrote my book almost 20 years ago. Um, and it talked about the Levitical priesthood. And, you know, I was always taught that the only thing that the priest did was to make the sacrifices on behalf of the people for their sins. I was never taught that the priesthood was actually appointed to teach, to teach the people. And that is how they would become a peculiar treasure unto the Lord God. It goes on here, it says, the Jews had been back in Jerusalem for nearly 100 years, but very little progress had been made in restoring the city. The temple had been rebuilt. However, uh, their powerful neighbors would disrupt and hinder the work. And so what happened is the people just gave up. And so for a hundred years, there was no rebuilding. You know, people, that, that can be us today with losing ground because we have not been working the works that we should have been working all along. How did this happen? You know, how did this all happen on our watch? And so many Christians talking about it today, leaders, okay, leaders, uh, talking about how did this happen on our watch, in America especially. We're talking about where we live. <laughs> Excuse me. And I want to read this to you because it says here, and when you read Nehemiah, you know these things, but I just I just want to read it out of the, the forward of my Bible. It said, Nehemiah told no one, or let's go back up here, Sanballat, the governor of Samaria and Tobiah, an Ammonite official employed by Persia, were responsible for the planned resistance get that the planned resistance are the ones who beat up my ministry vehicle okay the planned resistance to the building program Jeshem an Arab and tribal chief of Kedar joined them in the resistance Nehemiah told no one of his plans when he came to Jerusalem instead he made a secret personal inspection of the city at night and he urged the immediate rebuilding of the walls. Now, once they started building, I like this. I'm going to read this to you as well. It's opposition to the rebuilding. As the people under Nehemiah's leadership attempted to build the wall, they were met with opposition by ridicule. I want you to hear this. Ridicule and then by anger and then by terrorism get that ridicule anger and terrorism the enemies of the jews including including the moabites ammonites arabians and sumerians were in possession of land in that region and they bitterly get that they bitterly re opposed where am i at the rebuilding of the wall of jerusalem the people of Judah responded to the resistance by praying to God and continuing their determination to construct the wall. I'm telling you something, people, today. You have got to come to a place where you are going to be determined. They were determined. And it says, through faith and hard work, the wall was completed in 52 days and Jerusalem was once again a fortified city. Let me tell you something. 
when the Levites, uh, when Aaron was appointed a priest, Um, I forgot what I was going to say. I'm so sorry. He was to teach the people. Uh, Aaron, his name is Lightbringer. Bringer. When that he brings of God and the ways of God that he, that God had given to Moses up on that mount, he brought those to the people by teaching. Okay, and so the word of God was being brought forth as the light and Aaron was the light bringer the light bearer and God told him to cause them with the, these words to create unto him a people called Israel and Israel in though in that particular setting in the Hebrew means God prevails. God prevails. And he was calling his people to be like him. He put Aaron in place to be the light bringer that would bring the very thing that would cause the people of God to be Israel, which means to prevail. Now listen to me today. God wants his people to prevail in this day. There's a great warfare going on in this nation, as you all very well know by now. I knew of it 20 years ago by the, by the anointing and the revelation of the Holy Spirit. God gave me the insight, a window into today to see down the road that this was going to come. That's why he sent me to Iowa. That's why he caused things to happen in Iowa that never would have happened if I had just gone on my own. But my steps were being ordered by the Lord. Isn't that marvelous? And friends, we have enemies. We have enemies who are a planned resistance to us, okay, in our endeavor to stand up for righteousness in this country today. Now, we've got a line here that's taking place, and many of you well know this already, but it's a line that says, do we stand up and say that same-sex relationships are not God did not create us for that. Uh, transgenderism, God did not create us for that. God created man, male and female. He created them, amen? And he told them to go and to multiply and to replenish the earth. Well, what did he mean by that? He meant, if you, if you read all of the scriptures just prior to uh, the creation of Adam and Eve, all of the animals were created. And it says in the word that each one was created after its own kind, its own kind. Well, when it came to Adam and Eve, God said, now go and and multiply, multiply what? Multiply Adam and Eve. What he had created in his image and in his likeness. And he said, take and multiply this thing, just like the kind of the animals after their kind, after their kind, after their kind. I want you to multiply and replenish the earth with what? With this kind, with this kind. Uh, Genesis means a beginning of something. And Adam and Eve were a beginning of a kind that God created to fill the earth with. Now, Adam and Eve fell. So that was not the kind that God 
had in mind when he created them. God did not cause them to fall. It was their own choice, okay? And when they fell, that kind uh, was lost, okay? And only those who chose to, to follow God would mold themselves, uh, pattern themselves, bring themselves into alignment with the kind, the generation, again, a beginning, the generation of what God had created originally. So we have Adam and Eve, and he created them, male and female created he them. And this is what he wanted to multiply and to have. Hi, Julie. Good to see you. And have them fill the earth, replenish the earth with this kind. This kind. Man and woman who follow God. Man and woman who follow God's ways. That is offspring of God. And God is, is very, very, his heart is so huge. I'm telling you what he showed me in 2004. God's heart is so huge for the generations, my friends. And he doesn't just want generations. He wants generations. You see the multiplication process? He wants generation after generation after generation offspring of this particular kind. Now here are our children who are so innocent and they're going to school and they're being pressured and they're being pressured. I'm saying it again, and pressured. Don't you think for one moment that those children are not coming under heavy pressure from teachers, um, from other parents, from their, from their peers to have their minds completely brainwashed. Hi, Michael completely brainwashed by this planned resistance. This planned resistance. And let me tell you, when they go to school, and if they've been taught what we're talking about here today, if in the homes they have been taught that there is male and female, you don't just change your mind about who you are you know, we could get deep into that, but I don't want to go there today. I just want to say the title of this message is We Must Build Them Strong, talking about our children today, and we must be strong to build them. Now, that's a saying that the Lord gave me when we went to, I'm happy to see you too, Michael, that is a saying the Lord gave me. It was a title for a children's church. Uh, oh, I can't think of what it's called. Uh, but we formatted our children's church after that saying. We must build them strong and we must be strong to build them. Well, let me just say to you today. The same resistance, and we know about spiritual warfare from the New Testament. We know all about it. As Christians, we know all about it. But let me just, I just love that, that they, the planned resistance came in a pattern. They came first with ridicule and then with anger. But you see that anger in people who oppose what we're saying here today? People who are that planned resistance to what God says is today? It is a planned resistance, my friends. And it is against your children. It is even against your adult children who are like my children are ages, you know, they're in their 40s now. And um, they're Christians, okay? And like my daughter said, Mom, this 
has to happen in the home like you did with us. Yes, it does. But when it comes to this this thing that we have in the church where you don't you can't speak out about these things because if you do you're considered to be condemning people i'm not condemning anyone i don't condemn anyone and we've talked about this before many times uh when i've come to share with things with you we don't condemn people because jesus said God said, I did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, they might be saved. But I want you to consider this, um, this pattern here that they came. <laughs> Just a second. Let me get it back here. Um, They were met with opposition by ridicule. Let me get this in my brain here. By ridicule, then by anger, and by terrorism. Don't you see that today in people who oppose what we're saying here today? And let me ask you, don't you think that Christian children school systems today public school it doesn't matter what school anymore even the christian schools are falling into error today you know that as well as i do I have to plug my phone in here i'm sorry hold fast with me um and and we're not criticizing and we're not condemning but we're speaking truth and let me ask you or let me tell you we're going to be held accountable before god for whether we speak the truth because the truth is what what uh john said jesus said if you continue in my word um you'll be my disciples and my word will make you free. My word will make you free. Well, if we don't give the word of truth to people, they can't get free. They don't know that they have fallen into something that is uh, sinful and that sin leads to death. You know, before I came to the Lord and began to learn all about these things, I didn't know what that meant. Sin leads to death. Well, how do you how do you describe that to someone? Well, I'll tell you how now. Now I know. Um, sin leads to death. It's a sickness in your soul, is what it is. And we've talked about this before in a in a tape I did uh, a couple of months ago. A sickness and it, it it's death in your soul and and we have to resist that today by telling the truth in love nobody's going to get free if we're too afraid that we're going to be accused of uh, condemning people no we love people and if we love them then we come to them with the truth that makes them free you don't come in condemnation to them. And uh, yes, it's correction, Michael, that's, that's true. Um, but back to this, don't you, don't you believe that the children, when they go to school, if they are not going to conform to the culture that's being, uh, shove down their throats I know uh, of a couple of instances personally where these little girls you know 12 and 13 years old are now questioning whether they're really a boy why because the information is being fed them fed them fed them fed them pushed at them and if they don't 
uh, if they don't conform, then here we go. Here comes the ridiculing. Here comes the anger. And then here comes terrorism. You've seen on the streets with gay pride uh, parades and so forth. And, and just in conversations and people attacking people literally in the streets because they don't believe in, you know, the, the gay uh, system. They don't believe in transgenderism. What are we going to do with that today? Are, are we just going to sit and twiddle our thumbs and, and fret and worry about what are we going to do, Lord God? These kids need our help. They need our prayers, my friends. I'm telling you, they need, yes, it is. It is, it is absolutely Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the same thing. And the Lord told me that back in 19, it must have been like 1993. I dropped my children off at public school. I went home. I put my hand on the doorknob of my front door to go inside. And the Holy Spirit just came over me like a blanket. And I heard God say to me, it's time to take the children out of the public schools and into the home, back into the home. And now I've watched all these years how this has developed. And I'm, I'm just petitioning you today, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, you, we need your prayers. These kids need your prayers. They need your intercession. They need that covering. They need people caring about them. And again, that that doesn't even, it, we're not even talking about the sex trafficking industry. Um, I was watching a, <clears throat> a message last night online <clears throat> and they were talking about a, um, a sex trafficking building over in Africa and there were like I don't know how many floors in this one building and listen this is just one building we're talking about nations that are just overrun with sex trafficking and you know that the children I'm not telling you anything new today I'm not I'm not this isn't a great reveal <laughs> this is not a great revelation. These are things you already know. But I just want you to know, and I want you to, to be aware. The kids need our prayer covering. And if we can help in any way physically, I mean, if we can get involved in the school system, if you can go and petition your your people and your states to make a difference in the laws in our land. We need to be doing that. What? On behalf of the children. Let me tell you, when I got home from Iowa on that trip, when the same-sex marriage law was passed there, I got home, I put my luggage on the floor, and immediately I was in a vision. And I was standing in the middle of a street corner. It was like a four-way uh, corner. And I was standing in the middle of it. And the Lord took my eyes. I heard these little voices that were, um, these little voices that were crying out. And I looked on the one street corner and there was a, a lamp post and all of these children were were standing under that lamp post on that corner. Everything was in black and gray and the kids were standing there uh, placid with their arms hanging down at their sides, their heads hanging down and the atmosphere was filled with their words and their cries and they were saying fathers 
where were you when we needed you? Why did you not come to our aid? Why did you not take a stand for us? Where were you? And look at us now. And this deals with abortion laws in our land as well, people. And we've had a great victory in that. And I know that we're still fighting with the states. Um, it's happening, but we still have so, there's just so much going on that needs our prayers. Amen. And I'm not saying these things to discourage anybody today. We don't, we don't get discouraged. We don't get depressed. We just see the truth. And we need to rise up. That's what we need to do today, church. We need to be awake. We need to be aware. And we need to rise up and take a stand. Do it in love. But make the truth known. Amen? Amen. And, and these kids are bombarded today. Let me just tell you. Their minds are up for prey for who? For, for, <laughs> for the planned resistance. So if you can help in any way, in any way at all, youth groups, um, whatever you can do, do it for, for the Lord. Do it for the Lord and do it today. Do it now. Start now. I've been praying for a long time now, not a very long time, but for a couple of months. Lord, I'm here. I'm in my home. I really can't do that much right now, but show me something that I can do. And if all I can do is come to you on a Facebook Live and petition you for prayers of heartfelt intercession, I'm asking you for that today. And I'm asking you to consider that, you know, if you're going to speak out, if you're going to take a stand, you're going to be ridiculed. They're going to get angry at you. And they might even get to a point of, of terrorism against you in one form or another. I'm not talking about like a bomb or anything like that. I'm just talking about, you know, terror terrorizing you because you oppose what they're saying you have a different viewpoint it's not that you're arguing with them you're just putting out a different viewpoint the right viewpoint amen and i'll tell you what i think these kids would thank you would thank us um and i was going to tell you in that vision after I saw those children, then the Lord turned me around and I was facing the adjacent corner and I saw the, the corner under a lamppost where all of these men, young, old, aged men, and everything again was black and gray and they were all standing the same way, placid, heads hanging down, and they couldn't answer. They couldn't answer the children because how would you, if you were guilty of, of knowing that these things are happening and you didn't do anything about it, you didn't even try to do anything to stop it? See, this planned resistance, this opposition, let me tell you something else. Hi, Kathy. Something else I learned when I was in Iowa for the same-sex marriage law that passed there. I learned that it took one man from Colorado, one liberal man from Colorado who did his research. Let me tell you, he was cunning. He was sly, he was crafty, he was resourceful. And he found out that there was a law 
in particular in Iowa that no other state had. And what that law did in Iowa was that once the law passed in Iowa, people could come from other states to be married there. And when they went back to their home state, then that state had to, by law, change their laws to be like Iowa. And of course, we know that, you know, then it went to the top, um, uh, to the federal level, where, you know, it's just across the board, you know, everybody is, is free to have same-sex marriages approved. But let me just tell you, it took one person. Now, when the Lord 20 years ago took me back and was showing me about the Levitical priesthood and the teaching and the light bringer and causing people to be Israel, which means to prevail, you have to give me grace because you just, I'm asking you for grace. My mind just forgot where it was going. I just ask you for grace right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Yes, pet pedophilia. Um, I know in Europe that was a thing. Um... A few years back, several years back, uh, where they were encouraging uh, pedophilia, you could say it, pedophilia, in the home. It can, and that would be call, called incest as well. But where the parents and little children uh, sleeping together and teaching them things about their body that would cause them to be sexually active so that they would be groomed and accustomed to um, things of a sexual nature. And, and, and they, were, they were promoting that. They were promoting that. And so, yes, Michael, you're, you're right. And uh, I'm going to have to close up here. I do want to say one thing because my mind is just, I forgot totally where I was going with the priesthood, why I went down that road. Um, I've gotten my point across today, I think. Um, you're going to be ridiculed if you stand up today, and the children are going to be ridiculed. And God wants to use us in this day in a special way if we just allow him to, if we ask him to touch our hearts with such love and I don't even, I don't even have a word, compassion. That's the word, compassion for these kids today who are just so um, buffeted with all of this, all of this new information. Um, back on July 4th, 2006, the Lord woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and he said, Ginger, this is the information age. And he said, the internet is going to, this is what, if you break the word information down, which is what he told me to do, and you find the definitions of, of all of the syllables, in means for, for you to put yourself into something. Form means like a, a skeletal structure or a school of thought, a belief system. And Asian means you take action. So information literally means that you are putting yourself into a certain form and then you take action on it. And that's what's happening through the internet. Did you know that there's so much information comes out on the internet? I heard a statistic um, one time about how, how many uh, bits of information come out in just a second on the internet. It was like unfathomable. <laughs> it was amazing. And 
this is what our children are growing up with today. And you know, they don't know anything else. They're not like us. We have something that we can look back to and compare today to, but our kids, the young ones, they don't have that. They, they are, they're in it right now. They're totally immersed in what is being taught and what is happening. And so we need to be that measuring stick that uh, those ones that can point them to the truth and say, this isn't all there is. This is not all there is. Here's another view. Here's another thing. And this is the truth. And if you walk in this way, it will bring life and health to your flesh. Amen. And marrow to your bones. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. I want to tell you that um, <clears throat> I've been away from, from Facebook for several years. Uh, and that is due to a bone marrow transplant that I had in uh, May of 2019. And it did not work. It failed. <clears throat> but I'm still here. <laughs> and I'm so much better now than I was. I've had so many people uh, private message me and say, I thought you passed away or... I didn't know what happened to you, and here you are, you know, and um, I have a lot of people um, in other countries that I used to uh, minister with, talk to them a lot and encourage them in their ministries, and they didn't know where I was or what happened to me, and um, so just to let you know, I, I had a bone marrow transplant. I'm back at home. I was away from my home for uh, a little over three years uh, so that I could be at a different hospital to be taken care of in the way that I needed to be. And um, it was a long, long road of recovery from that. And I just kept having things. I would have setbacks this thing would happen and that thing would happen. And I don't like to talk about things like that because I just don't. But I'm here, I, I've been through a lot. My husband and my daughter tell me, mom, it's like since you got home over the past six months, it's like you've woken up from a dream. And it is. And I realized, um, about six months ago when I when I started trying to be on Facebook again that my brain um, I've lost a, a whole lot of, from my memory um, I've lost uh, I used to know scripture I used to be able to quote scripture and when I got home and i had been home for about six months and all of a sudden I realized that Lord I can't do these things father and so I'm having to learn things all over again and as has happened a couple of times in this video my brain literally uh, I forget what I'm saying so forgive me for that, but get my message today, if you will, and it's coming from my heart. It's coming from my spirit, <clears throat> where God says, you know, I want you involved in this today. You may not want to be, because you may not want the persecution that comes with it. But my friend, God is calling us to it. He's calling us to it. Put aside your fear of persecution and ridicule and anger and terrorism. Put that all aside and obey the Lord so that we can be effective in this day in the way that God would have us to be. 
I want to thank those of you who have joined Ken and Michael and Kathy and Susan. I see saw you on here. I thank you so much for joining me and uh, pass along this video if, if, if you would share it with your friends because we need people people get lazy. People get lethargic and they get caught up in the world and they're not and even in church um, amongst people who call themselves Christians a lot of times they're actually operating out of their own agenda they're not hearing from God they're not hearing from the Spirit of God because if they were they would be addressing these issues that I'm talking with you about today so those of us who hear, those of us who who know what we need to be doing in this hour, it's our responsibility to just do it. Just do whatever we can and ask God, hi pastor, ask God to open doors for you, to uh, bring to you instruction of where you could go and how you could be of help in, in this day for, for these matters that we've been speaking of. I hate to say goodbye to you, but um, I love you all and I'm praying for all of you here uh, as I'm here doing my days and um, I'm working on restoring, uh, remembering my songs that the Lord has given me. Um, I have 350 of them and I'm trying to recall them and the Lord is He's just such a beautiful, beautiful God that we, <laughs> our Father, He's so beautiful, He's so wonderful. <laughs> and He is able to do exceeding abundantly above what we ask, think, or imagine. And do you know every song, He, he brings it back to me line upon line. Uh, the music comes line upon line. <laughs> And, you know, the next thing you know, in my fingers, uh, they have not played like they should. And, and that, I'm working on that, and I'm working on my voice. Um, there, six months ago, I could hardly even speak. I could hardly talk at all. And so, um, God is good. Amen. God is so good. I'm still here. I'm making progress and I plan to continue to do that. So I bless you today and do take these things into, um, into the throne room with you when you go to meet with God. Okay. I love you. I bless you. And, um, leave comments if you have comments leave them for me i love to read comments i thank you for them i'll see you all another time soon love you bye bye for now